Welcome to the SCAA News for Thursday, November 7, 2013. Last week, minutes after uploading Episode 5, Rob decided it was ample opportunity to update the ship spec page. That put me into a tizzy because I had just uploaded a review of the Avenger. And with the ship page updated, it meant that all of the information I put up there was rendered, well, useless, kind of, sort of. So the ship page got updated and all these wonderful new ship specs are up there for the Aurora, the 300i, the Hornet, the Avenger, and of course some other ships that haven't really had all their variants released yet, but we could take a look at all of them as we go. To my surprise, one of the things that made me smile was that the Avenger page also got updated, or I should say the stats for the Avenger. When I was sitting in the Avenger, I made a comment about, you know, wouldn't it be great if they had a trainer version of this? And lo and behold, and it's after I asked for it, that prayer was answered. Looks like I have a little bit of clout with them. Isn't that great? Early on Monday morning, Chris Roberts had to do another one of those, yes, we hit this wonderful stretch goal letters. This time, it was the one for the $26 million. And that unlocked the capital ship systems. And what that is gonna do for us is give us the opportunity to take part in damage control parties, security parties, man consoles and systems, and all sorts of other key stations during battle. And that is going to add immersion to the game. I love these things that they're adding to the game at this point. It's not just ships, it's systems that actually make us feel like we're in a living, breathing universe. And I think it's unparalleled in the actual space that we're in right now. Well, I said space and this is space sim, isn't that great? Well, that led us to the current goal that we're on, $27 million, working hard towards it. We're somewhere between 30 and 40%, maybe a little bit more by the time this airs. And that is going to unlock the Banu Merchantman vessel as soon as we can shore up the rest of this $27 million. So here's what this says. Banu traders are renowned for their merchant prowess, traveling the space lanes and trading with everyone from humans to FanDuel. Their sturdy, dedicated trading ships are prized beyond all other transports sometimes passing from generation to generation. At the $23 million goal, we dedicated additional resources to making a Zion, I think that's how they say it, Zion, though I've heard it differently in other things, spacecraft, a unique experience. At $27 million, we'll, um, be do, we'll be, uh, we will expand that same thinking to the Banu, starting with the merchantman or merchant ship. The design team will expand Banner te technology to offer players a completely different way of experiencing the universe. Another ship and more ways to play. Personally, I like that. That is great. So what happened after that? Well, the next stretch goal was unleashed upon us. And of course, we're not even touching that one yet, yet because we have to get through the $27 million stretch goal first. The $28 million stretch goal is going to be a new starter ship. Yes, a new starter ship. Now right now we have the Aurora and it is by far the most popular ship in the game. And the game's not even out. And I think it's because of the price point. There are some of us that have gone hog wild in buying new ships and that's because they're just so pretty it's like having something shiny and having to pick it up right well in this situation we have a um wonderful opportunity to bring another starter ship to us and this is the way it's read the team at consolidated outland has decided to take robert space industries head on and this is in 2944 because we've already gone one year through the universe. And they're going to premiere the Mustang. 
We will use the additional resources to create another ship company and start a ship for the Star Citizen universe. The new ship will be offered for sale alongside the Aurora. So players have a choice between two options. The one also add, this one also adds a little bit of lore. This is what I'm saying, okay, to the game. So here's what I'm going to tell you. Founded by Maverick trillionaire Silas Corner, Consolidated Outland is an up-and-coming spacecraft concern. The first ever headquartered on a frontier world. Who world? Kerner, who made his sizable fortune in jump communications, founded the company as an attempt to strike back at what he sees as the overly regulated spacecraft industry. With facilities established as far from possible as far as possible from the prying eyes of competing corporations, Outland is quickly becoming one to watch. Now of course, in this lore, the Mustang's not out yet. After finding initial success with spacecraft conversion kits, Outland is now ready to take on the big boys. The new Mustang spacecraft line is preparing to go into mass production is priced to compete with RSI's Aurora using newly developed and um, construct sorry using newly developed construction techniques and ultra light material alloys sometimes considered unsafe the Mustang pushes power ratios to the limit the result is a sleek and stylish spacecraft that weighs less than the Aurora and has more options available for engines and thrusters at the expense of some stability, weapons, hard points, and cargo space. So I'm very excited to see this in the game. And one thing that makes me excited about this is it shares the name with my favorite um, aircraft, or I should say one of my favorite aircraft in historical our world. And that's the um, US AAF's P-51 Mustang, which was one of the top fighters in World War II alongside of the BF-109, the FW-190, the Spitfire, the Hurricane, the, oh God, we can go on and on. You know, there can be battles alongside of battles with which aircraft was better. But this one I really liked. And I hope that CIG is ready to take on a challenge, which is what the original Mustang actually did. Um, North American Aviation was approached by um, the RAF. They wanted them to make P-40 Warhawks and North Americans said, whoa, 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 that's not a good airplane. Let us see if we can come up with a new one. After some wheeling and dealing, it was agreed to. 104 days later, the Allison engined P-51 Mustang rolled off of the assembly line as the first prototype in the series. Now, although it was engined, by, you know, it was powered by an Allison engine, it was still a very formidable aircraft, just not capable of all the performance that the later models with the Rolls-Royce Merlin, which was shared by the Spitfire and some other very um, legendary British aircraft had, um, it wasn't able to um, run with them, but the Mustang very quickly became a favorite aircraft to people that were flying it, adopted by the um, USAAF and many other nations, and it flew for years after the war. So one thing I could tell you is that this is one of those things that I'm very eager to see happen. And Chris, take your time with your team making this happen. But if you can re-kindle um, some of that um, spirit that North American Aviation had and get this baby out in prototype, which means no, I don't need to fly it, but let us see it within the next 104 days, that would be great. Um, make that 104 divided by... Four. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, also, earlier this week, we um, some of us that were on the waiting list for limited ships, I've been waiting for an M50 for about three weeks now, we received emails from customer support. And essentially, those emails said that all of the support tickets for limited ships were going to be closed, um, especially those that were looking for the Vandal Scythe and the Idris M because those were one-time ships. They are never coming back. If you want one, you can get one in game through whatever means they allow us to get them in game, but they won't be coming back. But 
they are going to, I should say, however, they are going to release the limited ships that we've had available to us so far on the 26th. Sandy said that a, a um, schedule will be coming out later on as we get, near, get nearer to the event. But that means that ships, and I'm not sure if it's going to be all of them because we just had Gladiator and Retaliator come back for the second time. I can't imagine that they bring it back for a third time, but who knows. But that means those of us that want to look at M50s or the Starfare or the um, 350R will have that opportunity. I know there's other limited ships. I just can't remember all of them. Alongside of this, a little bit later on in the uh, week, we were given a look into the work in progress of the Idris class Corvette. And this is a multi-person ship. It's one of those things that the uh, $26 million stretch goal was gonna help to enhance the immersion of. And what we were given was the flight deck and some engineering space pictures of it in high def. And they'll be, sorry, I'm on a different side today. They'll be beside me. Um, this is going to be a wonderful um, ship, and unfortunately, I don't have the $1,450 to buy it, nor do I think I want to get a ship that needs so many people to man it, though I will gleefully man the consoles, damage control teams, or a fighter in any address that any of my viewers have. So if you need somebody to watch your back, that's me. I'm your girl. So... Um, Again, I'm just moving on through the different news. AMD and CIG both released um, concurrently um, news, re news press releases that stated that a Squadron 42 and Star Citizen games were going to incorporate into it the Mantle API. The new AMD cards were released earlier in the fall and this was done with a speech by Chris Roberts where he showed off some of the assets of the game. And it was almost assured at that point that this was going to be the case. I am not up on this stuff, so I'm just reporting this news to you. But this is the way I see it. Direct, DirectX has been around for quite a long time. And at this point, the games that are coming out, like the Crisis 3, engine games need a lot more horsepower than DirectX is allowing the games to, to um, latch onto. So the API in Mantle circumnavigates the DirectX API and gives direct access to the hardware, allowing the graphics performance of the games like Star Citizen, Squadron 42, to really pull from those cards and be much more efficient and much faster. Now, that's the Mantle API. I'm wondering if there is something similar for the NVIDIA cards as my beautiful iMac that I'm recording to right now uses NVIDIA cards. So, um, the lore segments I'm, I've been reading have been very, very, very well done. They are um, so far into um, Lore Builder Episode 3 and I think Episode 4 should come out tonight. We have done racing, we've gotten into Seda Ball, and I think that should be something that we're getting into now. Please read those. This is an opportunity for all of us to take part in the construction of the lore, of the background universe of the games that we're going to play. It may not be things that actually make it into the game, but it's something that we have an opportunity to help construct, and they will have meaning in the game. That's all I could say about that. And it seems that 007 has been hired on as a graphic artist, I think, at CIG. I was reading something before I started doing this that Daniel Craig has been hired. I wonder if that's the case because, oh my God, he's so freaking hot. But, you know, this does not look like the Daniel Craig I know. Even so, welcome to CIG's team, Daniel Craig. And I hope you are going to do an amazing job as everyone else has. Last thing, and I was just about to jump right past it. Um, there's a lot that I've been doing with this game and why this is coming so late. I need to um, give you the answer to that. And it's, I'm a perfectionist and 
Maybe that's the reason that I've worked for Apple for the last 10 years and IBM before them. I've been doing my best with the limited equipment that I have to do this type of video cast. I really have a lot of, um, a lot more that I want to do. And at this point, I'm shooting this with a Canon S100 um, a makeshift audio setup and a C910 webcam. And I really need to upgrade this. I've upgraded to a much better green screen and lighting and you know, I've got the upgraded iMac and I really want to make this better. And if there's anything that I can tell you, it's that this will get better over time. I'm doing my best, but between buying ships and equipment, I'm tapped. It's Christmas. So I've had a little bit of trouble getting this episode together and I apologize for it to come that it's coming out so late. I promise you next week I'll be a little bit earlier with the episode. I'm trying to make it so it comes out every Wednesday and that's not happening right now. So this is my apology because I'm not going to be able to get the F7CM review into this episode. And I highly apologize for that. I'm going to have news. I'm going to do an update on the Avenger and I'm going to do my wonderful um, confession of a star citizen addict. And then next week I'll bring to you a better, more complete episode. It really is mainly because I had a botched recording and at some point I've got to get a better video camera and it's just that I need the capital to do so. And if I invested the capital that I invested into ships, I'd be there already. But anyway, this is what I've got for you. So. Stay tuned for an update on the Avenger and I'm going to bring in the 325A a little bit to talk about that. The lore is going to be about Anvil Aerospace and then my ask, not ask, my confession of a star citizen addict. Well, I'll have that one picked by the time it's ready. Talk to y'all later and I will see you for news next week. So stay tuned for the rest of the segments. Bye. Anvil Aerospace is one of the earliest Terran success stories. Founded in 2772, Anvil has been reliably delivering military-grade equipment to the UEE Navy for almost two centuries. The initial Anvil Skunk Works facility was located in Nova Kiev, Terra, and the company's headquarters are still there. For the first 70-odd years of Anvil's existence, every design project was personally led by company founder J. Harris Arnold. Arnold, an eccentric spacecraft designer of old school who insisted on signing off on every part of his design's subsystems, was a beloved figure in an otherwise cutthroat industry. Today, Anvil has factories on three dozen UEE core worlds, but continues to source all systems itself and requires that the standing CEO sign off on every spacecraft alteration. The company's moniker comes from a quote in Robert Calvin's famous early justification for UEE expansion, explaining that military spending fuels the furnaces of expansion and strikes the anvils of innovation. There's little argument. Fueling the furnaces of expansion is exactly what Anvil has been doing since day one. The company has produced dozens of successful and iconic military spacecraft over the years, including the Hurricane, Osprey, Devastator, Hornet, and Gladiator. No military campaign in the last two centuries has been launched without Anvil spacecraft in the forefront, and no carrier in UEE space today operates without at least a squadron of Anvil-designed fighters. In fact, Anvil designs have historically scored more space-to-space -space kills than any other military spacecraft. Hornets in particular have destroyed more enemy hardware measured in star credits than all other current Navy space fighter designs combined. Core craft. Today, the F-7A Hornet is emblematic of UEE military superiority. Hornets grace recruiting posters in every corner of the galaxy, and lives of the fighter pilots who fly them off the elite Bengal carriers holding station on the frontier are not at all unlike the stars who play them in the holofilms like Chain of Command and Strike Leader. With proper tactics, Hornets have shown to be wholly effective against Vanduul Raider craft. 
with armament capable of delivering a stinging blow to even mid-sized Vanduul capital ships. In one recent incident, a lone hornet assigned to shadow a fuel convoy was cornered by three raiders and was able to eliminate all three without suffering heavy damage. The pilot name, withheld for security reasons, was awarded the Navy Cross for the engagement. Anvil also produces the Gladiator, a carrier and port-based bomber used throughout UEE space. Gladiators carry torpedoes needed to pierce heavier capital ships and installations, and are also, if increasingly rare, used as dive bombers in space-to-ground strike missions. With a defensive turret and drop tanks capable of unmodified cross-system travel, the Gladiator is an excellent battle platform. A high degree of configurability rare in military model craft means that Gladiators can be retrofitted aboard carriers as SWAX craft, search and rescue ships, or even trainers and target tow craft. In space dock, Gladiators can be fitted with everything from a jump drive reducing bomb load to a hollow targeting emitter. A true where you need it spacecraft, the Gladiator, like the Hornet, is among the UEE Navy's most favorite tools. Civilian Craft Anvil's civilian line is relatively new, a decision that many at the company initially resisted. The general feeling was that producing civilian-grade versions of dedicated military spacecraft would dilute the brand. Anvil's carefully maintained position as tip of the spear would be in danger. Debate over the issue became so protracted that it threatened to split up the company into two separate groups, with the civilian wing formally licensing the military designs. This was ultimately all for naught, as the UEE government stepped into the debate with a surprising resolution. They actually favored the concept of supplying military-styled weaponry to civilians, especially on the distant frontiers. A home defense militia squadron of slightly less than mil-spec but still fearsome hornets, it was reasoned, would make a better deterrent than a squad of Drake cutlasses. The process of civilianizing a design like the Hornet is more complex than it seems. UEE military secrecy laws mean that on average 60% of the hardware in a given spacecraft simply cannot be offered to the public. Some of these replacements, like mil-spec Gatling guns, would be expected and relatively easy to resource in a modern module of design, but these requirements also govern systems as innocuous as rudder pedal boot locks or rubber cockpit ceiling strips. Design teams must effectively work double-blind replacing existing systems without being given access to their military equivalents. In some cases, designers must reconstruct subsystems based solely on publicly available holographs while the team that designed the original systems operates next door, wholly unaware. Civilianizing top-of-the-line military spacecraft is a frustrating process, but one that has proved ultimately valuable for Anvil. Company profits rose 34% after the first civilian model Hornet, the F-7C, was made available with no perceptible tarnishing of the Anvil brand. Rather, the idea that you could own a military ship immediately became something of a status symbol, driving the resale value of Hornets and successive conversions. Civilian Hornets have essentially and unexpectedly become a luxury brand. Anvil's civilian equivalents sell both to actual paramilitary units on the frontier desperately in need of rugged hardware and to rich homeworld industrialists who believe that flying a Hornet makes them top gun fighter pilots. The Future with both military and civilian spacecraft spending at an all-time high, Anvil's prospects look bright. As the UEE continues to face off against a seemingly growing Vandal threat, orders for Hornet space superiority fighters and Gladiator bombers continue to spike. Several thousand of each are delivered to frontline carriers every month, at a rate that continues to rise as additional factories can be brought online. On the civilian side, the Hornet is holding steady as the third best-selling single-seat spacecraft design available, trumped only by the Aurora and 300i. The recent civilian conversion of the Gladiator looks to be a similar story, as the first model, Gladiator 1, becomes available to the general public in the next three months.
a few episodes, I was able to give you all a look into the 325A from Origin Jumpworks. It's a very formidable fighter and it is one of the best designs in my estimation in the game. At the very end, I gave a comparison that you see going by right now to the Aegis Dynamics Avenger with the ship specs that were available then. Well, things have changed, and I'm better able, since we now have these updated specs, to give a much more in-depth look at the A versus B, Red versus Blue, Avenger versus 325A versus Avenger. <laughs> so, this is what I have for y'all. First off, in today, which today is Friday, in today's actual Wingman's Hangar, I learned that the second seat in the standard Avenger will be disappearing. And we're going to be finding that the rear entry and walking through into the cockpit like the 325A is going to be adopted. So I guess when you capture your bounty as a bounty hunter, you're going to stick them in the back instead of the second cockpit. But what really made a difference for me was reading the actual ship specs page. The 34,000 kilograms of the Avenger was reduced to 22,000, which puts it just a hair over the 325A. Also, when you're looking at weapons hardpoints and weapons systems that are on these um, two units, you're going to find that they're very comparable. The actual Tiger Street Cannon and the Mass Driver are probably going to be equally um, deadly. The um, Joker, Sucker Punch, Disruptor Cannons, and the A&R Omniski Laser Cannons are probably going to be very comparable. And they both have the Stalker Image Recognition Missiles. So really what sets these two apart is going to be the look, the profile, and actually probably speed and maneuverability. So let's talk a little bit about that. After looking at the specs at the very beginning of this um, comparison, you can see that the Avenger has a smaller silhouette, which means that from far off in the distance, it's going to be a harder you know, spaceship to recognize. The 300i has a much bigger um, footprint. Actually, it's not much bigger. It's just a tad bit bigger. You can imagine that if the actual Avenger is going to be covered in a different skin, say all black, like the 325A, it definitely is going to be a much harder unit to see. And with its better all-round visibility, it may be able to see you first. So what next? The Avenger has a TR-5 thruster, or main engine as they're calling it now. Power plants and engines are different on the spec page now. And they no longer associate the primary thruster with engine, it looks like they're moving away from that. So you have a TR-5 that you could use, and the maximum on the actual 325A is going to be a TR-4. So you can see that from those specs, the Avenger is going to be a faster ship, kind of like an interceptor. The Origin Jumpworks 325A, however, has 10 standard TR-1 um, origin made maneuvering thrusters and two omnidirectional ones which I would gather the ones at the very front that could probably shoot in any direction um, these are going to give it a high degree of maneuverability so what you're looking at is going to be speed versus maneuverability and who in this situation will get to dictate the terms that the dogfight happens on. That's going to be kind of difficult to say. Because if you're really disciplined, you're going to fight the dogfight the way that your ship handles it best. You're going to use the assets of your ship. So if you're looking at the Avenger and taking on a 325A, you're going to want to do a hit and fade. You're going to want to come in real fast at your top speed, do a slashing attack, shoot at him, and take off in the distance and then turn around and come back and do the same thing. The 325A however is going to want to take this Avenger into a turning fight where with its increased maneuverability is going to be able to get the Pipper on the target better. Now upgrade slots, 
crew number and all this other stuff isn't really going to change anything. Four versus six upgrade slots. I don't know how or what that's going to be used for. Shield systems, we know that they both have a max shield three. And I don't really know how that's going to um, affect anything at this particular point until the shield systems are revealed to us. My thinking here is this is still a toss up. The better pilot is going to win the dogfight and neither the 325A or the Avenger are going to be overpowered against the other. So ladies and gentlemen, fellow citizens, take your pick. Pick the one you like. And that's all I have for you. Hi, my name is Nick B and I have an addiction. It's the first step to solving my problem is by admitting that I have one. I have spent $900 US on pledges and another $1000 US on upgrades to the computer. I'm even planning to base my upcoming thesis on Star Citizen. Wait a minute, money and fun? And it's going to get me through my masters? Wait, I'm in the wrong room. I don't have a problem. It's a golden ticket to happiness. Love the comments on this thread. It makes me realize I'm not alone and in good company. Good luck, everyone. Hello, everyone. Nikki Becker of the Angelo here, just with a special report at the end of this episode. It's taken so long to get this one done because of all the work I'm doing this week for my job um, that I figured I would stop and just get this in here so we can get some really good effort at helping um, Cloud Imperium games support this charity event they have. So Veterans Day Hornet Upgrade Offer. Essentially, and I'm going to give you the long and the short of it, is that there's an upgrade which is a cosmetic upgrade to make any Hornet that you have look like the military version. Now, Cloud Imperium Games never intended for us to have something that would look like the military Hornet, but they are trying to support this charity and this is something that they thought would help and the proceeds from this event are going to go towards the Black Widow Company's Play to Give Back organization. I'm going to read you just a little bit. All right. And from now until midnight Pacific Standard Time, November 11th, you will have the opportunity to upgrade your Hornet into the style of an F7A military Hornet while also supporting a worthy cause. The F7A military Hornet upgrade pack costs $20 and 50% of the proceeds will be donated to the Play to Give Back charity. The donation will be used to support both Operation Supply Drop and the Honor Flight Network. Operation Supply Drop sends video, games care, video game care packages to soldiers in high combat areas as well as soldiers recovering in medical facilities. The Honor Flight Network transports veterans of past wars to Washington DC to visit and reflect at the monument that and the, sorry at the memorials that were created for them. We initially built the F7A Hornet for Squadron 42 and for use by the UEE Navy and Star Citizen and until now had no plans on releasing it to the public as a ship option. Because we feel so strongly about what Play to Give Back charity does, we decided to make the upgrade available initially on a limited basis. The upgrade packs will ultimately change the fuselage of your F7M Hornet to match the F7A Hornet. If you have a Hornet variant like the Tracker, Ghost, or Super Hornet, the upgrade can be applied to change the styling without eliminating your egg additional upgrade modules. This is more than a skin in the game world. It's an aftermarket fuselage upgrade kit. We will be updating the whole geometry of the ship. Please note that the upgrades will not appear in your hangar module immediately. As we are continuing to update the look of the military Hornet. Remember, Squadron 42 is not even close to being done yet. We hope you will be joining and honoring veterans by supporting these important charities. Thank you to the Black Widow Company for connecting with us with this great charity endeavor.
please note that the Star Citizen community and the development team are international groups, as is the Black Widow Company. Our support of these charities is not intended to, intended to support our po particular politics. I'm going to stop there. I agree with that. This is just to support people, not to support the ideas behind what they do. So I took part in this. It's a good cause. I have a nephew that was um, deployed over to Afghanistan and um, I know that my mom, while she was still with us, sent him care of packages all the time and they really do make their stays over there especially more, um, let's just put it this way, um, anytime they can get something from home that's a good thing. So I hope you take part in this, if you don't that's your decision. But this is a good cause, and it gives you an upgrade to your Hornet. Thank you all for watching, and I will be with you next week. And you all have a wonderful weekend. Bye. Hey, you guys want to fly with me? I'm the guy that builds the space games. <laughs>